Welcome back to Chapter 7. Today we'll be t talking about theater history. I know we've already talked about a lot of theater history, but we'll go specifically into um, more detail, especially when it comes to Eastern theater, uh, theater in Asia mostly. Um, I have to be uh, humble about that. I've been to China once. <laughs> it was a wonderful experience. Um, the people were very kind and the language was very musical, but that's about my extent of um, real uh, exposure to um, Asian culture. I've never been to see any of these Eastern plays that we'll talk about today, although I certainly hope to before I die. So today we'll be talking theoretically about Eastern theater, um, even though I have limited first-hand exposure. Um, but I put some clips there in the D2L portal for you to look at. Um, I'm sorry that they're buried in these longer documentaries. Um, I do appreciate that Cohen brings there to our attention, um, but I, they're still not widely um, taught by other curriculum, so I had a hard time finding good clips um, in our online uh, library. So um, I apologize that they're sort of buried, and you know you have to listen to uh, about Japanese embracing Western culture before you actually get to watch the clip of no theater. So I uh, thank you for your patience, and uh, I hope you enjoy this sort of exposure to different cultures and different. Um, uh, exotic places that maybe you've never don't think about often on a daily basis. So first of all we'll talk about what is the sort of foundation of theater. When we say when did theater start? Well theater starts every time that someone tells a story. Every time that any tradition across the world has a ritual. The ritual is one of those keywords, page 197. So that's my husband there. <laughs> um, a wedding ceremony is one of the few American rituals um, in its true form that we see today. Uh, you know, women traditionally wear white, as I did. You can see there we stood in a church in front of a minister. Uh, and if my husband had sort of haphazardly said, you know, you know, do you take this white woman to be your wife? If if my husband had sort of said, yeah, uh, sure, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I would have been upset. <laughs> I wanted him to say the words, I do, right? Because that's just sort of um, our ritual in our vows. And I did the traditional vows because I'm a very traditional person. Um, and I like the idea of repeating what you know, thousands and thousands of other people have been saying for years and years. So uh, a ritual is something that can be deviated from, obviously. Uh, some of you may not have worn white at your wedding. Some of you um, may have chosen not to say the pro, you know, the traditional vows. But a ritual still has an element of um, this is how it's done, right? Uh, it's a collective ceremony. It's for a culture or a group of people and it's normally associated with a religion in some case I know my wedding was so a baptism is is a ritual um, in the Christian denomination uh, for the Jewish people uh, circumcision is a ritual just an example um, obviously you know I had my son circumcised but I didn't have him circumcised by a rabbi um, so it wasn't a ritual um, necessarily. Does that kind of make sense? So you're kind of trying to see the difference between a ritual. Um, in a lot of cultures that were tribal, we talked about this when we talked about costuming, um, putting that animal headdress on and reenacting the hunt. That's a, that's a ritual that they do um, often to sort of bless the hunt. Um, <laughs> it looks sort of misleading there. Those, those are uh, Celts and they are um, worshiping a tree, right? This is a sort of uh, imagined uh, scene, but we do know that the Druids would uh, circle around a tree because they believed in the animism, right? They believed that, that object was inhabited by a uh, spirit, right? And that was something that happened um, in my own culture, right? In the Scottish and Irish tradition with the Celts, it's something that happened um, 
in in lots of African cultures the belief that this object is inhabited by a spirit. Um, shamans were often, as we describe on page 198 there, uh, they were the tribal sort of connection to God. And we, once again, we kind of touched on this when we talked about costuming, but the person who's sort of a medium between the um, spirit world and the um, the tangible world in front of us. So if we look at a culture such as voodoo, um, the shaman will go into a trance-like state and, uh, and have seizures and uh, do feats of acrobatics that maybe seem otherworldly or uh, larger than life. And it's not uncommon for them to do magic. You see I have there a sleight of hand. Um, and sometimes it's known, okay, this is, you know, pig's blood. It's not actually him stabbing himself. And then other times, as in the Egyptian culture, uh, you know, it was believed that they were really performing real feats of magic. Um, you know, some of our um, more uh, tribal cultures used masks, right, to represent animals or to represent um, that trip into the other world. So we can kind of deduce that these religious rituals had a very costumed, had a very um, theatrical feel to them. And so we know for sure that some of our major dramas, both in Japan and ancient Greece and Egypt, they came directly as a result of these religious rituals. So, we don't really know a lot about Egyptian drama. Um, we know that uh, there was this one passion play that was performed every spring, and um, it is about uh, Osiris, who's the wheat god, and he's torn apart by Set, who's the god of death or chaos. He he's, uh, tears Osiris apart and throws him in the river, and then uh, Osiris resurrects as Horus. So this sort of um, is a metaphor for what's going on with springtime, right? Um, everything has died through the winter and now we have a resurrection or a um, new life. And that's a, a story that's kind of universal through a lot of religions and obviously um, there's some pretty crazy theatrics going on here as described in the um, <laughs> in the textbook uh, tears off uh, testicles and puts them on his own body and uh, you know bloody eye as depicted by a ruby or a red stone so there was a lot of theatricality and this was performed along the river um, but soon after this well not soon after this but later on we know that um, a lot of the Middle Eastern theater was suppressed uh, because uh, the religion of Islam forbids the depiction of their gods in imagery of any kind. So that would include, you may have um, heard about some of the cartoonists um, and all of that. Uh, I don't want to get into all of that right now, but it's it, the same applies to theater. Um, so moving into Greek drama, which I've talked about a lot, as I said, Osiris was the wheat god, and so we have reason to believe that when the Greeks did their, you know, whole conquering thing, they picked that up and um, moved into creating this other god, which is Dionysus. I mentioned him when we talked about storytelling because uh, all plays still kind of have a sense of celebration and we're all together in this. Um, he is associated with uh, sex and fertility. Uh, he is the god of wine and um, rebirth and uh, blurred lines. As you may say, like, what is the what's the similarity between um, sex and wine? And uh, he's kind of the god of um, you know what is real, what isn't real. So. Uh, the festival that was named after him was called the City Dionysia and the Great Dionysia, which is all about this demigod and celebrating him. There were traditionally um, orgies going on. Uh, we don't know to what extent, um, but that definitely carried over into the Roman times when, we'll talk about later, it turned into mostly orgy-centered. So, 
Uh, moving on to page 202, we have these Greek chorus. As I said, when we talked about um, I think it was what is a play you know the Greek chorus were very tribal initially and they stomped on the threshing floor and they moved in a circular pattern in order to separate that wheat and uh, they would have chanted and sung and it would have been um, a force to be reckoned with these 12 to 15 dancers sort of um, moving in unison and speaking in unison would have had a very uh, um, you know guttural and and visceral feel but we know that it must have evolved in some way we just don't know how much we don't know what that chorus even though we think of chorus many of us we think of singing we don't really know if it was sung or chanted or if they spoke all at the same time or different people spoke um it's, it's really no way to tell we do know that they were all male uh the performing of women was you know women in the Grecian culture rarely left their homes uh, we don't have much reason to believe that the women would have been performing at all they would have had these uh, tall shoes and colorful gowns with tunics uh, they would have worn a mask that uh, projected their help project their voice um, we know that the playwrights also directed their plays some people um, believe that uh, that the you know uh, that the performers were paid and that the playwrights were paid uh, we can't really substantiate that we do know that the government is what supported the festival of Dionysia back in the time you could either um, if you were wealthy you could either buy a boat or you could buy a play <laughs> you could be a sponsor to either a boat or a play and these were competitions um, just like the Olympic Games the different playwrights who directed their own play would be competing against the other two playwrights uh, in the week-long festival. So there were three playwrights competing. Each one wrote a trilogy. Three different plays performed back to back, um, which was basically a full day of theater. Right? We would at sunrise we would hear start the first one, break for a meal, you have another one. You get the point. Um, and in between the second and the third one, we had what's called the Seder play. The Seder play uh, was the comic relief, often a parody of the play, kind of poking fun at, having fun. Um, satyrs, uh, you can see there, were um, part goat, part human. Uh, if you uh, watch Percy Jackson, all right, his friend there, he was a satyr. Uh, his companion uh, but the satyrs would have often worn uh, puppet phalluses because there was a great bit of um, phallus worship a uh, penis worship in this um, Dionysian festival because it was he was the god of fertility and so uh, there um, would make lewd gestures and uh, they were very much a crass kind of humor around the satyrs they were mischievous and they were servants of pan so they were wild and chaotic uh, in in their nature so that's just kind of a peek a deeper peek at the uh, Greek theater the Roman theater kind of shifted into more comic uh, kind of theater you can see that the uh, theater kind of changed a little bit there were vomitoriums uh, where people would go down and vomit uh, because they would believe they had this you know that they would eat and then they would purge themselves of it and they kind of an extension of the um of the uh sense of catharsis you know and the crying um and well and the romans were just very indulgent people and and so um, there were one of the f most famous comedies uh, was by Plautus and he had the twins and the twins got you know the two Monacani and they they get traded places so you've probably seen this in a modern movie or um, in a you've seen it in a classic play if you've read many classic plays it, it becomes kind of a standby if we look at uh, two gentlemen from from Verona or a lot of Shakespeare plays he uses this twin device often um, and these stock characters what we mean by stock characters is kind of a stereotype so if you're watching a uh, 
teen movie and you see a blonde woman walk in, you know that she's probably going to be ditzy, even though not every blonde you ever meet will be ditzy. If it's a teen movie, they're going to, you know, sort of operate in stereotype. So there were a lot of stock characters in the Roman theater, and people got to know them, kind of like a sitcom nowadays. Well, they kind of just stopped doing theater altogether. <laughs> And turned those facilities into places to, um, you know, have gruesome public massacres, uh, which you probably uh, familiar with the Colosseum and the horrible um, slaves being eaten by wild animals and that sort of thing. Uh, but they also had decorated facades. You can see there they were a lavish culture, very wealthy. You can see those three doors and uh, all of the pillars and things. So they sort of expanded the architecture of the theater. Uh, for those of you who are Hunger Games fans, um, you may have heard this word Panem before. That's the name of the um, the wealthy city in the Hunger Games. It's, uh, the Hunger Games is partially uh, based on Roman culture. And uh, Panem is commonly quoted here. Uh, Already long ago, from when we sold our vote to no man, the people have abdicated our duties. For the people who once upon a time handed out military command, high civil office, legions, everything... So they, the democracy used to have all of these higher thoughts and higher expectations and uh, pursuits. But now, as he says, restrains itself anxiously hopes for just two things, bread and circuses. So where we used to be high-minded, philosophical, now all the Romans do is eat and watch theater and and not deep meaningful theater like we studied like a Oedipus they want a circus they want a distraction and I think this is a fair critique of theater in general that it can easily become a distraction from reality rather than a way to study or deeply uh, come to terms with reality um, not that that's always bad but if it becomes a lifestyle of indulgence and eating and um, amusement uh, that can be gluttonous which is what Tertullian thought. <laughs> Tertullian was a church father. Um, he was an aestheticist, so he didn't believe in um, pleasure of any kind, really. Uh, he believed that if a man ejaculated, part of his body would be, his soul would be leaving his body, just to kind of give you a sense of how ascetic he was. Uh, uh, once again, I, I apologize if that's sort of... Um, uh, uh, heavy today we're kind of reaching more adult topics here but um, so Rome fell um, there were a lot of uh, prostitution in the theater uh, going on a lot of uh, possibly sex going on in the audience as the show is going on because it was part of the religious ritual Tertullian, you know, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. He believed that if you saw evil, it could actually travel through your eyeballs and infect your body. Um, now, the church shut down the theaters, but it still allowed some of the religious festivals and some of the religious rites of the Romans to continue. So um, Caesar, for example, was called the sun god, and uh, he was paraded through town, uh, and then they just turned it around and um, had these parades for Jesus instead of Caesar. So some of the rituals were just kind of rebranded by the church. The biggest context when we start talking about medieval theater, as we move into the Christian religion um, as it used theater, is how illiterate the people were. Uh, the primary purpose of these beautiful stained glass windows is not just for decorations, it's to help people understand the stories, because um, language at that time was very uh, divided. You know, you could you might speak German, somebody else might speak French, um, someone else might speak English, and so the common language was Latin. The Latin was the language of the educated, of the scholars, and of the priests. So if you were on your pilgrimage to um, 
you know, Spain, you could go to Mass in Spain and understand if you were a learned person. Um, and so it was kind of the universal language. As a result, the illiterate, uh, you know, and remember, this is the Dark Ages, so they just plague after plague and hardship. Um, if you were not uh, ever taught how to read or had the money to have any sort of real education, then when you went to church, you, you didn't know what was going on because they were speaking a language that you didn't understand. They were speaking the language of the educated, of the elite. They were speaking Latin. So um, out of desperation, the church started doing dramas. Now they uh, would have, during Mass, they would have a little playlet, such as the example in your book here of um, the first woman at the grave to um, when Jesus was resurrected, and they have this sort of um, conversation at the tomb, um, you know, whom do you seek, Jesus of Nazareth, that exchange, uh, he is risen. So that little playlet would happen during Mass, and it would have people, um, just, you know, priests reciting the lines back and forth. Um, uh, but then, you know, a couple hundred years later, we started doing theater at these festivals. The one they mention in your book is uh, Corpus Christi, which of course means the body of Christ. Um, but any of these holy holidays, the 12 days of Christmas, um, any of them, you know, would likely have had some festivities going on outside. A lot of the performers, remember actors at this time were considered unclean, they weren't afforded a Christian burial, um, but uh, these festivals, common lay people would perform, and um, so if you were uh, in a union, for example, you were one of the um, fishermen. The fishermen might all get together and put on Noah's Ark as for the festival, you know, as kind of groups of people. Uh, the most popular form of Christian plays still performed today are, of course, The Passion of the Christ. Uh, they have in your book about a Bavarian city, uh, but they're also very popular in um, Mexico. Uh, some of them are pretty controversial because uh, people are actually whipped and uh, actually um, sustain some injuries during if they play Jesus uh, so that so it can be kind of controversial but you know we have passion plays in churches all around the south going on um, Gatlinburg does a really big passions play with uh, uh, I can't remember the name of it right off the top of my head but small villages in Europe still do passion plays around the Easter season so um, this is a pageant wagon. In the medieval time, they would um, perform up on top of the wagon, you can see there, so that the people can watch. It's just kind of like a stage. And uh, people could go down underneath and change clothes or put on a mask down below the wagon. And uh, another great thing about the wagon is then when they were ready to do that same play again um, at a different time of day in a different area of town, they could just hitch it up to the horse and move on over. So that was kind of the advantage of the pageant wagon. They were used during these medieval times, but they were also used in Italy during the Renaissance when we talk about uh, Commedia dell'arte. But like I said, different unions would get together and uh, use help with the these festivals. This is a hell's mouth. You can see the flames and the um, men with pitchforks poking people there. Uh, so maybe if you were a welder or, um, you know, a, a blacksmith of some kind, you as a union might get together and put, uh, put a, together something like this for a festival. Once again, you know, we did have some professional gestures and actors, uh, but they were very looked down on in society. Commedia dell'arte. So we have the Renaissance. With the Renaissance, we have a rebirth, a rediscovery, particularly of the Roman plays, but also the Greek texts. Um, they were found uh, 
and so people started to restage them and it sort of ignited this interest in theater as a legitimate art form. Another big secret of the Renaissance is that there were wealthy people backing these artists, uh, you know, and theater started to be really done for profit again. And so that was a big break for theater because people get motivated to make good theater for the money, right? So you wonder, like, why are there all of these great artists during the Renaissance uh, in paintings and sculpture and theater? Uh, it's, it's because they had wealthy benefactors. And so people were able to really, um, you know, put down their day job and devote their full time to the theater. Commedia dell'arte is a semi-improvised uh, comedy. They would have a lot of shtick, uh, including a slapstick, which was two pieces of wooden with a hinge on it, and they would smack it together, and it would make a quack sound, and they would beat their slaves with it. Ha ha ha, isn't that hilarious? Beating your slave. Um, but when we say the word slapstick today, we mean this sort of comic uh, falling down and um, you know, kind of the Three Stooges gags, those uh, would be associated with Commedia dell'arte. A lot of physical humor, a lot of stereotypes that were, um, you know, there was a body old man and there was uh, the sweet little young lovers and a lot of the sitcoms that we watch today still draw on the uh, Lazzi that was performed during these Italian masked humors. Uh, you can see can't really see the masks in the picture I have there and they don't have masks in the picture here uh, but trust me they were <laughs> there were masks in Commedia dell'arte uh, not everyone was masked but some of them were um, so yeah that was going on in Italy women were performing on stage for the first time uh, that was pretty exciting there were these families that would perform Commedia dell'arte together so it's humorous it was some of the characters are masked and it was going on in Italy. So as we turn over to the Renaissance in England, as if I haven't said Shakespeare, Shakespeare, Shakespeare enough, that was the first time that I went to the Globe there in the winter. Uh, just had a wonderful experience. Um, but you can see that it is a wooden O. It had uh, an interior that is sound absorbent. Uh, it has that wood that uh, you know keeps it from echoing and ha really has great uh, sound. Shakespeare primarily wrote and performed here, but he also performed indoors during the Jacobean Theater. Um, he performed for kings and queens and things indoors, but this Globe Theater, as it says on page 212, it's a thrust stage. There's um, standing room where those people are standing there. Um, if you want a picture of the interior, you can move back to page 210, although I know I showed you a picture of it uh, earlier this semester. But you can see kind of the stage and the performers on stage and the groundlings standing there around the bottom. Um, Shakespeare's plays are witty, they're uh, intelligent, they're comic, they're poetic, uh, they're deep, uh, they're um, just so rich and full of meaning. Uh, and we'll uh, talk about Hamlet, the last chapter in this course, uh, which is my favorite play and a lot of theater practitioners' favorite play. Hopefully it'll help you to um, build some genuine appreciation for Shakespeare. Uh, but, you know, Shakespeare was a, a businessman and he had partial ownership of this Globe Theater and when he uh, was acting and writing these plays at a furious pace and he was driven to do his best work because like I said there was um, money to be made in it so there's something to supporting the arts that way and uh, pushing people to do their best and uh, drawing out the best talents so moving on to Royal Theater, on the left here, that's Country Wife. I uh, assistant directed that when I was in graduate school. Uh, that is um, the Country Wife there in the white and the corset. Uh, and then the guy on her uh, left is not her husband, which is kind of where this story is about. You can see the 
lavish costumes there on the right and the kind of comic just way that he's even holding his hand. It was a very light and happy time. Uh, Louis XIV, uh, very famously, uh, the ar- aristocracy was lavish and um, witty, and it was a good time to be rich. And if you watch a royal play, or what some people would call a restoration play, they're going to have a snuff box, they're going to have a fan, the men are going to be wearing high heels in many cases, uh, but not every case. Uh, And it's going to be... um, indoors, cushy, light-hearted jokes. Sometimes there were recreations of the classics in order to please the royalty, Um, something like Racine's um, Phaedra, which was written in the style of the ancient Grecians to celebrate it. Uh, But most of the plays were light-hearted and witty and performed for the royalty, primarily in Europe, which is why it's called royal theater. The Romantic Theater um, is marked by Goethe and Victor Hugo, if you've ever seen Les Miserables. This was an age where they explored the romantic side of life, the grotesque, the exotic. They had monsters uh, such as Dracula, and uh, he comes out of this era in the novel, of course, not on the stage. Um, But you can see Cyrano de Bergiac on the right there. He... uh, is this lovelorn soldier who doesn't tell his uh, the woman that he loves that he loves her until he's dying in her arms, you know, <laughs> leads the way for melodrama because it's got these larger-than-life things um, and it pushes the passions of life to the extreme. So it's sort of a precursor to uh, melodrama. So that was a breakneck speed of the West, most of it a review. Let's look at some differences between the West and the East. And these are huge generalizations, but in general, the East is concerned with imagery and beauty. If you go to see a play in the East, it's going to have very tactile expressions. You know, you can hear the drum beat, you can um, watch the beautiful scarf as it flows through her arm across the stage. It's not as much about the poetry or the plot drivenness like we talked about with Aristotle, loving that rhetoric and logical flow of events. The Eastern is more visual. The costumes are, in general, much more extreme and much more detailed and um, definitely no confusion about who's on stage and who's in the audience. They tend to be mythic. There are these larger-than-life stories, and which is probably why there's so much more uh, visually in the way of costumes. Uh, these stories are about gods and goddesses. They're about demons. They're about witches. They um, are much more epic than an everyday life kind of story. Before the once again, this was before the East was affected by the West. Um. They're not plot driven. Uh, you know, I bought a uh, collection of no plays to study for my honors theater class, and I, I brought it, and it was only, you know, a two page play, but it was meant to be performed for, you know, 45 minutes. <laughs> it's definitely not um, just by looking at the script, it's almost like if I were writing down a dance, it doesn't fully depict what's going on in the story. Most of the training in the East begins as a child. You watched that Katakali clip uh, with the little children um, being corrected gently by their masters, their trainers. Um, you know, it's from the time that you're small is when most training begins in the East traditionally. So Katakali is a Hindu practice. It is telling the story of these Indian epics, and as a result, they take hours and hours and hours to tell. The festivals, as they said in the video, last for weeks, Um, but they begin usually at 10 in the evening, lasting until the next morning. It's really a long play. They don't go on in traditional theaters like we might think. They're usually in um, random places. They might be in someone's house or in a park. Uh, You saw those very specific eye movements and a lot of the costuming that we're doing um, 
is to emphasize uh, those eyes and those highly stylized um, makeup to help represent that. Moving on to the Chinese opera, uh, in your book it says Ching Chu, but I just for clarity will say opera since it's a pretty um, it's a pretty uh, foreign word X I Q U. It, just for reference, you say Ching Chu. That's how you say it. But Chinese opera, you can see her beautiful headdress there and all of the detail in that wig. It's just phenomenal. Um, Chinese opera was popularized uh, in the West when a traveling actor, uh, Mi Lan Fan, came and he, you can see, is a cross-dresser. He dressed in, uh, portrayed a woman at this time. Remember this was uh, before the, the revolution and as we heard in the Japanese clip, uh, it, there weren't many women on stage. Um, there are now, if you go to Beijing and you were go to go see a Peking opera or a traditional Chinese opera, you would see a woman depicting those roles. Uh, but remember, this is the case not only in the Asian theater, it was also in Europe. You know, Romeo and Juliet, Juliet would have been a woman. Uh, Phaedra, any kind of classic Grecian play, um, Jocasta in Oedipus would have been portrayed by a man. And these men always would have been valued by their... Um, asexuality by their lack of uh, masculinity. It's uh, traditionally always been an aspect of the theater, as has prostitution. I'm not saying that about this performer particularly, but um, the theater and prostitution have always been uh, hand in hand. Um, the training is often very difficult. When we look at the skills required of a uh, opera uh, here on the bottom of 216, it's almost as if you'd have to combine um, an American ballet, uh, an opera, a Shakespeare company, the Ringling Brothers, and the French Foreign League and all of those skills in one. I heard a interview on a BBC show uh, of a man who came from London to go study with the Chinese opera and he said it's almost as if Pavarotti had to learn to do a backflip land in the splits and then sing his high note so these skills are not something these acrobatics these flexibilities it's not something that you can do overnight and so the training often begins as children there's not scenic elements or lighting effects these plays were traditionally performed in banquet halls for the emperor so it wasn't meant to be um, in an opera house with all of the technology if you want to call it that all of the scenic design that we have today uh, it's marked by those beautiful embroidered robes they call those water sleeves those uh, sleeves that are kind of flowing through the air there lots of makeup Lots of lots of makeup. Skills that are required of the actors, acrobatics, sword play, um, musical instruments. Uh, if you are interested in seeing more copies of this, there's a uh, movie, it's on Netflix as I record this right now, Farewell My Concubine. Just to warn you, it does have some R-rated material in it, but it is a um, beautiful depiction of the falsetto voice, for example, that um, goes along with the Chinese opera. The man who depicts a woman and sings in falsetto is, is just a beautiful, beautiful um, art form. But um, so during uh, the revolution, uh, Mao uh, banned all of these traditional Chinese operas that were performed. And they were very traditional. They had been performed from the time of Shakespeare up to the present day as they were written and passed down from one actor to the next, uh, you know, down to the footstep. Uh, there was a scene in that movie that I watched very well, My Concubine, where he says, I noticed you took three steps instead of two. You know, that's the kind of detail that was really prized in the Chinese opera. Um, but Mao, uh, a lot of these plays were very um, honoring of kings and queens. They were, all, like I said, a traditionally performed in the kings and queens um, banquet halls. And so... I'm sorry, I say king and queen, I mean emperor. I'm not always a stickler for detail like the Chinese are uh, in their opera. Uh, so instead of this emperor worship, Mao's wife, who was a um, 
performer in the Chinese opera or in some way and tied into it. She then um, wrote and helped popularize um, these other Chinese opera that honored the proletariat, that had more to do with um, with the common man, which of course would have been part of the idea for a communist country. Uh, the problem then is it was forced down their necks. It was played on the radio constantly. Uh, forced down their necks? I mean forced down their throats, obviously. Um, it was, and so it, the opera really fell out of favor because it was used as a propaganda tool by the government. And so it's only recently risen back into popularity and slowly um, become kind of an evolution and changing and and um, as is China and their government as they start to kind of rewrite who they are as a country. Japanese no. Now um, this was started in um, a monastery. The uh, actors were all performers uh, who were very religious they were telling the story of the Buddhist gods and it's a very um, supernatural kind of story it's the oldest continuously performed drama in the world um, they it's very solemn and slow moving it's played in mask and um, it's a very specific kind of theater. They have these cypress floors. You can see how that shine is coming up off the floor. And um, it's waxed and it has a very definite noise that it makes when the actors walk. Uh, it feels like you're in a temple, apparently, when you're watching a play like this. It's very precise once again and it's very meditative. There's a lot of um, stamping that uh, derived in the stamping through the rice outside. I actually did some of this um, Buddhist and Shinto uh, meditation when I was in graduate school as actor training. Uh, it's called the Suzuki method uh, and uh, it was meant to do the stomping was meant to get the attention of the gods and also to wear you out. They believed that when you were tired you were more honest and so um, it's meant to be kind of exercise, strangely enough. This is very foreign to a lot of uh, modern Japanese people. It's, it's kind of com comparable to our opera, but more meditative, more spiritual in nature. Um, but it's definitely not for the common man. It's not what everyone enjoys in Japan. It's a very niche market. Kabuki is very popular. This is something that, um, like I said, a lot of different children go to see. Um, as you said in the clip, it's kind of considered crass or um, uh, low class to go to the theater, which I think that's kind of funny that it's kind of a uh, reoccurring theme in the theater. Uh, it was often exotic. The clips that I've seen of Kabuki, uh, you know, one that I watched was pretty bizarre. And actually, David Sedaris has a short story about it. Is a fox being um, brought back to life, uh, reincarnation kind of thing. Uh, there's sometimes fireworks in Kabuki plays, passionate emotion, melodrama. But of course, just like any. Um, any genre that it's a very broad you know there are things that are so more bizarre than they're just simple love stories uh, domestic stories kabuki was actually started by all women per performing in a it was considered sort of erotic and so the uh, Japanese government shut it down and then it was started by all women I mean all men and you've probably some of the costumes as you look through your book you may notice they are very similar to sort of these woodblock prints that are very um, popular if you go into a Japanese restaurant you may see a woodblock print of these kabuki performers because they were that's almost like us opening up an Us Weekly right uh, because those would have been the kabuki performers who were famous in their towns uh, for their singing and their entertainment abilities and their acrobatics or their fighting song dance skill is what kabuki means and it's um, it's a very flashy perform of entertainment um, very melodramatic so once again this has just kind of been a drive-by of several 
different forms of theater. If you'd like more information uh, and more in-depth about these styles, uh, I'd be happy to point you towards famous plays from that season or, um, you know, movies that are set in that time period. Uh, but this is a little deeper taste of our traditions as a world. So, as always, thank you for listening.